All right, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 is where we're at. Give you a second to turn there. While you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. I want you to be honest. Are any of you guys tired yet? <laughs> I mean, whenever, if we're completely honest, whenever we get into the Christmas season, we just, we exhaust ourselves. Many times it's not bad things that we're doing, but we just overextend. Uh, we look at the church's calendar, and it's full. Like, it's, it's cram-packed. And then we move over into our work schedules, and it's cram-packed before the end of the year. And we look at our family schedules, it's cram-packed as, as well. And so we just, we wear ourselves down. It's so, bu- so busy, it's so exhausting. We're trying to create memories with our families. Uh, we're trying to uh, keep traditions maybe that we've kept year after year. And by doing that, we wear ourselves out. But tonight, I'm inviting you to, to stop and uh, don't fall asleep. It's easy to do that. But I'm inviting you to stop. And I want your mind's eye to rewind back 2,000 years ago. And we want to walk through Luke 1 as uh, Luke describes it to us. And to do that, if we rewind back 2,000 years ago to where we're about to read, we'll find ourselves in a small village in ancient Palestine, on a cold, starry night. So picture that in your mind right now. A cold night in a little small village in ancient Palestine. Now, if you were to go back 2,000 years ago and see this scene, it would look completely different than what you'd see today. The buildings would look different. The people would look different. Things would smell different in Luke chapter 1. Uh, the way things were during this time, people didn't have the kind of heating that we have. You would smell smoke. Uh, you would smell manure. Uh, things would just be completely different. You wouldn't see electricity. You wouldn't see lights on. You would see candles burning. People would be gathering around fires. It's just, it's just a completely different setting than maybe what, what we're used to. So Luke kind of sets the scene for us. And then imagine in your mind's eye walking down a rocky path outside of the city. And in Luke 1, we see something, I guess I could use the word, kind of disturbing. If we really see it in its raw place here in Scripture. You see a young woman. And you can picture in your mind's eye her long, dark hair, messed up, with straw in it. And she's wrapped up in dirty in a dirty cloak. <laughs> uh, this isn't necessarily sanitary conditions that we find her. And in Luke one, we find her having, I guess we could say, a, a hard, long night. <laughs> I mean, she's went through a lot at this point. But what's even more disturbing is seeing this young woman. In her condition is to look near her and you see a dirty stable with a small baby wrapped in bloody cloths. What I'm trying to paint for you guys before we go on is a realistic picture of Christmas. You see, the Christmas cards that you received this year, the the pictures that you see, what we see put out by secular society is completely different than the real Christmas here in Luke chapter 1. Earthly traditions never show the realness of the first Christmas scene. Many times we think of Mary after giving birth to Christ. Uh, she's, many people paint the picture that she's glowing which in fact (laughs) would not be the case for for poor Mary. She's bone tired. And then you think of the little child, like there was no halo on Christ after he was born. 
Uh, in fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse number 2, For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. Now listen to this. Some of us try to, try to imagine what Christ would have looked like, but Isaiah 53, verse number 2 said, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He would have looked just like a normal baby. There was nothing in his physical appearance that you would say, hey, that's Christ. He just looked like a baby. There's, n- there's nothing in Luke 1, as Luke describes, that, that would point to the fact that Mary is who we know her to be, and Jesus is who he, just by looks, just by outward appearance, it's just sort of plain. We probably wouldn't have even recognized them at all unless we'd known this story here. Now, this Christmas scene that I just described to you guys is nothing really that we picture whenever it comes to Christmas. The real Christmas has this sort of feel of helplessness. Can I even say this? The real Christmas story has the feeling of homelessness. It's not like how we paint the picture of Christmas. The scene here in Luke 1 is more like what we would find underneath a bridge. (laughs) Uh, Our response to this girl is pity, sadness. I mean, literally, she just had a baby in straw, uh, in a barn. Luke chapter 2, verse number 7 says this, There was no place for them in the end. So, it's helpful for us tonight to pause and to leave our Christmas list behind, to leave the cookie pans still in the, in the sink, uh, to, to pause our Hallmark movies, and all the other things that we have going on in our mind and going on with our time to be reminded of the real Christmas story, what really happened. So, I want us again to look at Luke chapter 2 first. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse number 7. The Bible says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and lied it and laid him in a manger. And then the Bible says, because there was no place for them in the end. I mean, the Bible says there was no room. I mean, literally, this is Christ, the Son of God, and there was no room for Him. They, they couldn't find any room. And here's my question to us tonight, and this is the foundation of our, of our time. They couldn't find room for Him. My question to you tonight is, Can you find room for Christ this Christmas? Do we have room? Has the Christmas traditions that you have come to know, do they reflect the picture I just painted for you guys in Luke chapter 1? When you think of Christmas, when you think of memories of Christmas, is it connected to this story? Many of our traditions and mem- memories have nothing to do with the real Christmas. It's sledding, or it's eating this particular meal, or it's getting this particular present, or going to this particular place. But it has no- it's not connected to, it's disconnected from the true meaning of Christmas. And that's dangerous. Because we're displaying that we have no room for Christ in our Christmas. John chapter 1, verse number 14 says this, And the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. Christ became flesh for one reason, in order to make justification for condemned sinners, just like you and just like me. Christ was born to die in order that you and I might be made righteous, in order that we could have a relationship with the Holy God. Listen to this. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21 says this, For he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Christ came, he was born outside of the village in an obs obscure place, and he also lived a life and died outside the city. Like, there was no place for him in the city. He, he was born outside, and he died outside. First John, or excuse me, John chapter 1, verse 10 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Man. So here's the idea tonight. Like, Luke chapter 2, verse 7, There was no place for them in the inn, is there room for him in our hearts? How can we prepare room in our hearts for Christ this Christmas? I want to remind you of the only detail that the Holy Spirit gives us about the birth of Christ, and that's this, that there was no place for him in the end. That's the only detail that we're given about the actual birth of Jesus. There's no room for him. So, as we look forward to this season... Christmas season, our encouragement tonight is, as the song says, let every heart prepare him room. Surely, out of all the people in the world, we as Christians can prepare room in our hearts for Christ. All right, now for our passage. Luke chapter 1, verse number 16. The Bible says, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Then the Bible says, To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. We talked a little bit about this this morning, but when we get to verse number 16, we find a man named Zechariah. You guys remember Zechariah? Now, Zechariah and his wife, what was her name? Zechariah and Elizabeth had lived much of their life bearing disappointment. Um, they're older in age. Why were, why was Zechariah and Elizabeth disappointed? What was one thing in their life that they'd prayed for, but the Lord just had not granted it up until this point? So they had, they had prayed for a child, but they had not received a child yet. So look in chapter 1, verse number 9. Actually, go back to verse 8. It says, Now while he, this is Zechariah, was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Zechariah heads into the temple to drop incense onto the altar and offer a prayer for the people. And then, look at verse number 10. It says, The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Now, while Zechariah is inside the temple, everybody else is out. Everybody else outside is praying as well. And then something happens. Notice verse 11. It says, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, do we know which angel this was? We talked about this this morning. The same one, right? This is Gabriel. This is the first time he was sent. This is the moment those 400 years of silence was broken. It says, There appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, this was a once-in-a-lifetime thing for Zechariah to enter in. And we read in verse 11 that an angel angel appeared to him. Now, the angel Gabriel is about to tell Zechariah that his prayer, a prayer for a child, that prayer has been granted. Let's read verse 12. The Bible says, And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Verse 14, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Now, 
verse 15 is going to tell us that this child, John, who we know to be John the Baptist, would be great in the Lord. Verse 15 says, For he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Now what the Lord is going to do in John the Baptist's life is the Lord's going to use John the Baptist to spark revival within the nation of Israel. Look at verse 17. He will go before him, talking about Christ. John the Baptist, again, is the forerunner. He will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So John the Baptist did for the nation of Israel what the season of Advent can do in the life of the Christians. John the Baptist was used by God to spark revival for Israel. And I would submit to you guys tonight, this season of Advent, of building anticipation, of reading with expectation, with, with encouraging morale as spiritual leaders in our home headed towards Christmas, that can also spark revival individually and within our families. That's why when we're pushing Advent, that's why we're spending time this December going through Christmas passages, Old and New Testament. Because I want you guys to understand, here in a few days, we're going to roll into a brand new year. And, and what I'm wanting us to see is we can establish a pattern in December, maybe we've never done it before, of reading our Bibles, uh, spending time with Christ. It can carry on, not just in the Christmas season, but all year long. You guys remember, we really, really pushed this hard uh, three or four years ago, and we started Advent strong. There's many families here at church that bought in. I mean, they were reading. They were leading their families strong. They were spending time alone with the Lord. And because we built anticipation for Advent, many of those guys are like, hey, this ain't too bad. I can do this. And then they carried it over to implement family worship throughout the rest of the year. So again, I tie it back to Luke 1. John the Baptist sparked revival. The Lord used him to spark revival in Israel. Advent, looking towards Christmas, building anticipation and excitement can spark revival within our homes. That's why we're going through this. All right, let me get back to the passage here. I don't want Christmas to find us collectively as a church unprepared. You know, there's a lot of churches, you know, the week of, then they start gearing up for Christmas. No, I want us to be prepared for whenever Christmas gets here. Uh, what I'm talking about is I want us to be spiritually prepared for whenever Christmas gets here. So tonight, I'm going to submit to you guys five ways that we can prepare him room. Uh, five ways we can prepare our heart for Christmas. The first one is this, and I, I think on the way here to church, I, I'm going to change this first point, so bear with me. I, in my study last week, the first point was decide with decoration. And the more I begin to think about this, the more I believe that decoration is not the problem whenever it comes to Christmas. So I'm recanting on my first point. Um, I do believe many of our problems as Christians is not putting up decorations. There's nothing sinful about decorating your home. I think what is sinful is the condition of our heart. When we allow decoration to creep in, when we allow the busyness of the season to creep in. So it's not a material problem, it's a heart problem. You know, if we desire to be a God-centered family, you're going to have to decide what you're, you're going to do with decoration. You're going to have to decide what you're going to do with Santa Claus. You're going to have to decide these different topics. And we talked about this last Sunday night, so I'm not going to go there. I want us to understand 
many times the decorations and all of these things is an American substitute for what only Christ uh, can give us. I've seen this uh, go sour a lot uh, m in many families. The uh, how can I say this? In many American families, the truth of the of the incarnation, the truth of Jesus coming as a man, is less thrilling than the lie of Santa Claus. Um, there are so many children get so worked up and excited about Santa Claus, but whenever you talk to them about the truth of God coming and sending His Son Jesus, oh, there's no excitement there. So again, number one, decide with decoration. Decide how you're, if you want your heart to be prepared this Christmas, you're going to have to work through this American culture, uh, these, this sort of, uh, these expectations that are placed upon our family living in the country that we live, you're going to have to work through those things. Don't allow the temporary things to be substituted for the eternal things. Number two, meditate on your need for the Savior. Many times the reason why Christmas isn't exciting is because we don't see our need for a Savior. We're not excited that He came because we see no need for Him. You see, we, as men in particular, uh, like to meet our own needs. We don't want to be seen as needy or dependent on anyone else. Why is Christmas not exciting for many folks? Because they see no need for Jesus. They already have all that they need. Luke chapter 2, verse number 11 says this, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior. Christ came to be a Savior, to save sinners. If you don't need a Savior, then you don't need a Christmas. Christmas will do nothing for you until you see your desperate need for someone to come and save you. That's, a re that's the reason why last Sunday night we put all of these Advent resources up here. It's pretty picked through now, but that's why I encourage this. Daily Advent readings. Because if you, just, if you just go through your daily routine without spending time in the Word, then you're go not going to see your need for the Savior. But if you spend time in the Word, if you're, if you're going through these passages, if you're reading the Bible consistently, you're going to see how uh, lacking you truly are. Your sin's going to be exposed. So again, so I'm, I'm pushing you guys, I'm encouraging you guys to be in the Bible during this Advent season. That way the Lord will show you your need for Him. Um, that's why I encourage you guys to come back on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights leading up to Christmas. I've been praying that these messages, these times that we're getting together, awaken our need for Christ. We, we need Jesus. God knew that. That's why He sent His Son. So, number one, decide with decoration. Work through those things. Number two, meditate on your need for a Savior. You want to prepare your heart? Then you need to meditate on that. Number three, engage in sober self-examination. Advent is the season leading up to Christmas. Advent is to Christmas what Lent is to Easter. Uh, Lent is the 40 days leading up to Easter in which we reflect on the cross, cross uh, substitutionary atonement for our sins. Lent is the season in which we, we self-evaluate we, leading up to Easter. So Advent does the same thing. The Bible says this in Psalm 139, verse number 23. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You want to prepare your heart for Christmas? then ask the Lord to expose things in your life that are distracting you from spending time with Him. Christmas is a, can be a good wake-up call for those that have completely blew this last year. You knew you were supposed to be spending time with the Lord. 
you, you've just been running from fountain to fountain, and you've not been satisfied this last year. Christmas is a good time for us to evaluate, hey, what went wrong this past year? Where was the break? Where did it, where did it fall? W go back and trace. When did I stop reading my Bible? When did I stop spending time with the Lord? When did I stop praying? When did I stop gathering together with the local church? Engage in sober self-examination. Here's two questions I thought of on this point. Number one, is there anything within my heart that I'm letting compete for affection that belongs to Christ? How much time have you spent this holiday season on Amazon or online looking for Christmas presents for your spouse, for your grandchildren, for loved ones? Just, just think, realistically, how much time have you spent either traveling to stores or looking online for Christmas presents? I mean, realistically, think in your mind's eye. And then I want you to combine that with the time that you spent planning meals and planning Christmas gatherings, whether it be at work or at school or uh, church. I want you to combine all that time, and I want you to weigh that with how much time you spent with Christ. Let's just say in these past three weeks, which one outweighs the other? The temporal or the eternal? How much time have you spent Honestly, devoted and unhindered, unrushed time with Christ. Next question. Is the stress of family, events, gift buying, competing with the energy that would be better spent preparing our hearts? Again, engage in sober self examination. Where, where's your heart right now? Are there, are there things there that should not be there? Number four, build God-centered anticipation, expectancy, and excitement in your home. I'll be honest with you guys, until about six years ago, um, there was no discipline of participating in Advent within our family. Uh, growing up, we, I mean, we went to the activities at church, but like our family growing up did not participate in family worship and Advent. We didn't. I didn't even know what it was. But what I'm encouraging you guys to do is to participate, and especially as spiritual leaders in your home. Build excitement for Christmas, especially if you have children or grandchildren. If you are excited about Christ, if they see Mama and Papa excited about Christ, then they will be excited about Christ. If they see Mama and Papa excited about the gifts that they're giving, then that's what they're going to be excited about as well. Don't be surprised if they turn out just like you. Here's just a few questions. Are your children and family only excited about material things? If your children and your family are only excited about material things, how can you ever expect them to thirst for God? I mean, how, how, will, how will your children ever become thirsty of God they only see you excited about material things. How can you do this? How can we make Christmas exciting for children without material things? I think we have, uh, we're competing with a lot in the world, but I've seen it firsthand, how children can become excited about the right things in Christmas. Um, so, uh, I don't see any of the boys in here. Every night, we seek to do an Advent reading with our family during family worship. Uh, what we do, and I've showed you guys this before, we have this little candle holder, and the kids uh, fight over who gets to light the candle. Um, and that's just, that's just one layer of it, but 
It's the simplicity on, of sitting on the floor in a very simple way, praying before we read, lighting a candle, explaining what that candle is supposed to represent, working through a uh, passage, talking about Christmas, allowing a kid to blow out the candle, and praying again. It's very simple, but what it does is it, it causes us to stop in the busyness of our week or of our day, and it develops a pattern that carries on the rest of the year. So having Advent readings, having an Advent candle, all those little things are things that kids remember, and they'll continue to remember. I remember the negative side of never doing that, but you guys have the opportunity to display that in a positive way with your kids and grandkids. Uh, I think all the devotions up here are gone, but uh, there's a particular Advent devotional which every night you cut out a different animal um, or a particular object, and you use that object to teach kids uh, about Christmas. Uh, anything that you can use to build excitement and anticipation. Uh, and I just want to remind you guys, Men of your home, you're responsible for that. You're resp you're, it's not your wife's responsibility to find these resources and to lead in these resources. Some of you guys are saying, well, my kids are already grown. Well, men, do you understand you're also responsible for leading your wife through this season of Christmas? When, when was the last time you asked, hey, when was the last time you asked your wife, what are you reading? How are you, do you know how your wife is spending time with the Lord? Have you asked her how her walk is with Christ? Guys, I mean, just the, the bare bones of it is you're responsible. If she can't find resources, if she's not being led well, that's on you. It's not your pastor's responsibility. That is your responsibility as a husband. So, again, there's resources out there. Don't just kick the spiritual can and say, well, I don't know what to do. I've never... There are resources out there. Uh, there are resources and catechisms uh, that I've recommended to new, least, new believers and, and uh, new men in Christ that they learn as they teach their children. So, again, no one's without excuse. Men, you're called to lead. All right. So we're to build God-centered expectation, anticipation. You're to bring in excitement into your home about Christ. Um, but also number five, be much in the Word. Now, some of you are in seasons of life right now that you have more time than other folks. We're, we're all given 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. Uh, but some of us have different responsibilities. Um, I want to encourage you that are in a season of life where you have more time than you ever have to memorize God's Word. Uh, some of these scripture passages talking about Christ's coming would be super helpful to memorize on the grounds of evangelism. Uh, you can use these passages to talk about Christ. Uh, Listen to this. Jeremiah 23, verse number 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord. Think about a fire for just a second. Think about the holiday season. How many of you guys burn wood? Does anybody in here? Okay, just a few. All right, so you guys know I love to watch a fire. I love to smell the fire. It's just something, not the fire, but the smoke and the wood burning. Um, I love that. But isn't it neat that the Lord describes His Word like a fire? Now we could, that's a whole different sermon, but there's this sense of excitement with a fire. Kids see something burning, they love it. They love to light things on fire. But fire also brings a sense of peace as well. Um, so when we think about the fire, we encourage you to gather around the fire of God's Word this Christmas season. What do I mean by that? God's Word is warm, it's sparkling with grace, it's healing for your hurt, and it's a light for dark nights. Um, 
We've covered tonight five different ways that we can prepare our hearts for Christmas. So I just want to I want to encourage you guys to prepare your hearts. Ask the Lord to prepare your heart this Christmas. Uh, like we're not, we're not going to be able to go back in time and relive this Christmas. I want to just encourage you not to waste your life. Intentionally go to the Lord and ask Him, Lord, if is there anything in my heart that's out of whack? Is there any, any area of my life that's off-centered? If there is, ask the Lord to forgive you for that and to change your direction in order that you can prepare room for Him. You won't be sorry. And you also, if you, if you do this, you're going to establish a pattern that will carry over past the Christmas season into a new year. All right, let me pray for us and we'll be done.